A brilliant man joins me today, a political theorist. He is the chairman of the Edmund Burke Foundation. He is also the author of a new book called Conservatism, A Rediscovery. With me now is my friend Yoram Hazoni. Yoram, good to see you. Hello, Liz. Good to see you, too. As always, if you want exclusive early access to interviews just like this one, you can join us on the Liz Wheeler Show community on Locals, which intuitively is at lizwheelershow.com slash locals. If you use my promo code ACCESS, you can get one month free on your annual subscription. That's lizwheelershow.com slash locals for exclusive early access to interviews just like this one. Um, Yoram, before we get into your newest book, I want to make sure to set the stage properly. You make an argument to return to national conservatism. Now, that that phrase, national conservatism or nationalism, the left likes to claim that it has racial undertones. So I, I want to start today by just asking you, can you define the term national conservatism as you mean it? Yeah, sure. Let, but let, let's let's just start with nationalism since that's you know, that's the word people object to. So na- nationalism is a principled standpoint or political theory that says the world's governed best when uh, independent, many independent nations are given, given the, the, the right to chart their own course according to their own interests and their own traditions. And uh, the, the reason this word nationalism has come back in the conservative camp is because for the last 30 years, there's been sort of a, uh, a, a dominant view of conservatism. People, a lot of people call it neoconservatism or just liberal internationalism, which was a a view that said uh, uh, America's ideals, Europe's ideals, they're the same and they're universal. And and the goal is to wrap the entire planet in in one rules-based order, one system of law that would just govern everybody. And that's, you know, that that that's what gave you policies like you know the the uh, the war in Afghanistan and 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 uh, in 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 Iraq, and I I think it also had to do with with uh, uh, de-emphasizing uh, the importance of borders. You know the way that we saw in Europe that they they simply eliminated the borders between countries, um, and so uh, national conservatives are those of us who thought that this idea of um, one one law, one idea to rule the whole world is just a terrible, terrible idea. And uh, we, we looked at the sort of the, the political spectrum and you look, you see there's kind of like a, uh, uh, a political center where these liberal internationalists and neoconservatives are, and libertarians are. And then on the far right, there's all sorts of people who are like, you know, white identity and, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, in between, there's a huge space. I mean, I, I think most conservatives are in that in, de, in between space. And we, we decided before the first conference to adopt the, the, the NATCON term, the national conservative, to emphasize that we're trying to refocus people on conserving, on transmitting, on, on restoring independent nations. We're not trying to run the whole world. We want a, an alliance of independent nations. And you know that the, the moment you start thinking that way, national interests, national borders, our national traditions, which are different from other people's, um, it, 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 I, I think it gives you a whole change of perspective as to what conservatism actually is about. Yeah, it's very interesting because I think the conservative movement as a whole, and I would hope the Republican Party, although I don't know that the Republican Party is as thoughtful as the conservative movement, we've been looking for an alternative to either isolationism or interventionism, interventionism being neoconservatism, essentially. Um, And and this, this is an answer that you're offering. Here's my question, though. My question about this idea that each independent nation state gets to decide what their norms, their tradition, and their laws are based on their their history and their culture versus this this overriding idea of there being some international norm what happens if they violate human rights on a on a on a large scale if you have a situation where um you know there there's a you know a a, a slaughter a hundred a hundred thousand people are being killed in wherever it is or hundreds of thousands uh, in a place like Rwanda and Cambodia uh, it, it's obvious that you have the right to interfere you have the you know, the, the right to stop it. The question isn't really about the right. The question is, um, what's the best way to, to look at these things? So if we take just like a really extreme case where um, you know that, you know for sure something horrific is happening 
and you could just, um, and you have the, you know, the, the, the capacity to project power far enough so you could just go in with a, with a massive force, put a stop to it and get out instead of, you know, then occupying the country for the next 50 or 100 years, then I, I think it's clear, you know, everybody would say, do it because because the the what's happening is terrible and the cost, if you think of it like that, then the costs are low. The problem is that that kind of condition is usually not what's happening when somebody's arguing for an intervention. Usually what's happening is there's there's some kind of a war. You don't really know what's going on. The, there's propaganda from both sides and it's you know, it's very far away. And the only way that you can, you know, think like how am I going to put a stop to it? Or at least at least the way people have tended to think in American Europe in the last generation is, well, you know, what caused the war? What caused like the root causes of the war are, you know, all these tribal hatreds and 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 and, and or religious hatreds or whatever it is. And the only way to put a stop to it is if you go and occupy the country indefinitely and rebuild their entire culture from, you know, from the ground up, which is basically what Americans and Europeans were doing in Afghanistan and in Iraq. So the, the, the argument isn't, no, you don't have any right to interfere. The argument is much more uh, realistic and practical that most times when people are arguing for, uh, for interfering, uh, you don't actually know enough, and it, it's very likely that the damage you're going to you're going to do is huge. I mean, to just take like the 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 intervention in in, uh, in Iraq and the attempt to set up, you know, a li liberal democracy in Iraq. Different kinds of conservatism. What they have in common is that that they're 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 very em empirical. They're not about trying to impose a structure universally. They're about um, looking at what's happening right now. So we, we look at, at Ukraine and, uh, and we, we see a nation that uh, is, is valiantly fighting to try to maintain its independence against, uh, against an imperial invader. Uh, and, and, and I think, I, I think that's just a really, really good um, example for understanding the, the, the different issues that are at stake. The first thing to understand is, uh, is that where a nation is fighting to maintain its independence, there's a lot of things that you can do to support them. You know, the, the uh, su supplying military supplies, supplying economic supplies, um, hel helping them with with uh, medical medical issues and 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 uh, uh, receiving refugees. There's many things you, you can do to support a a another government, which do not involve you sending your army in to fix the problem, which always ends up being like an endless occupation because there is no way to fix the problem. Right. And I so we just had a we just had a national conservatism conference in Brussels. We do we alternate between the American one and the European one a few weeks ago. And I mean, it was very, very powerful and moving because, you know, people people in the room that they, they have friends, they have relatives in Ukraine and uh, it, it, really an intense conference. And, um, and, you know, and the people were getting down to arguments on things like, uh, you know, like uh, some of the, some of the P Polish speakers were saying, let's send in a peacekeeping force. And, uh, and most of us were saying, you know, what are you talking about sending a peacekeeping force? A peacekeeping force can only happen once there's a ceasefire. If you, you send a peacekeeping force into a war zone, they'll get killed and you're in a war. Like, what are you going to do? They're, they're going to shoot at you and you're not going to shoot back. So. I, I think this is just a really a really good case where nations can have solidarity with nations. But first of all, you know, at an emotional level, that you know we, we 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 identify with what it is that they're doing. But then, when it comes to the practical things, different nations are going to be able to uh, supply different kinds of assistance. And it it it's not our job to win the war for the Ukrainians, because the moment that it's our job to win the war for the Ukrainians, then it's our job to rule the world. Right. I mean, there's no there's, there's no way to stop that. And I actually I actually think American policy um, has has been pretty, pretty successful on this point that that, that uh, help is being given. And uh, but ultimately, America is not saying this is our, you know, our fight. We have to go in there and like 
settle it all. Your new book is called Conservatism, A Rediscovery. Um, and in it, you make the argument, and I find this so fascinating, by the way, you make the argument that American conservatism is not any longer, or perhaps never was, um, equitable to classical liberalism. Explain that to me and tell me what the difference is. After World War II, uh, there's a uh, there's a big confusion in, uh, in, in the United States that sort of like gradually gets worse and worse between conservatism and liberalism. And uh, what, what liberalism is basically a philosophy of freedom. You know, I mean, all of us cherish freedom, but, but the, the principles of liberalism are about how, you know, giving, giving people maximum rights in order to be, so other people aren't bothering them. And conservatism is a, uh, it, it, it's a, it's a philosophy of how you maintain uh, a, a, a nation uh, over time. Whereas liberalism doesn't, I mean, when you, when you take, you know, the classical liberal, works of classical liberalism don't even ask, mostly they don't even ask the question, how do you maintain a nation over time? And so, the, you know, the answer is, um, well, if everybody's perfectly free and everybody's perfectly equal, as some of the you know great liberal theorists said, um, then and the government's not allowed to do anything other than to defend those rights. So the question of how do you maintain, which is, I think a very b basic question, you like your society, w what do you need to do to keep it? Or you know, um, as the a lot of the younger people these days um, say a lot, you're conservative, but what have you conserved? Like. This, this book is about what would you have to do if you were going to conserve something. And there's a big tension between those things, because if you want to actually transmit something from one generation to the next, I mean, anything, I mean, it could, it, whether it's God or, and scripture or an idea of marriage between man and woman, or, or even if what you're trying to t transmit is, is, you know, a, a, a right, like the right to, free, to speak freely. All of these things, in order for them to uh, to go from one generation to the next, so that they continue, they require constraints. They, they if you tell everybody just you're free, do, do whatever you want, then the whole thing runs down and falls apart. I mean, that's basically what we're seeing in the United States right now. Is 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 that everybody's liberal for a while, and then the Marxists get you know try to take over, and then the liberalism collapses, and then you you, you have this woke neo-Marxism, which is is. Uh, literally putting put, putting an end to the the traditional order in the United States and in in Britain and in other countries. So, cons so so the post World War II conservatives, you know, what what came to be called the, as the conservative movement is actually an alliance. It was an alliance between liberals and conservatives. Um, they were they were fighting together against communism abroad. And again, socialism at home, but the the liberals were people like uh, like uh, Frank Meyer and uh, and uh, Leo Strauss and Friedrich Hayek and Milton Fried Friedman and Ayn Rand. All of those are people whose philosophies are ultimately that's what I argue in the book. Ultimately, what they're what 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 they're trying to do is to get people to care about about individual liberties. And then there's this other school of of thinkers that are, you know, pe people like, like uh, 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 Russell Kirk and Robert Nisbet and later Irving Kristol and George Will in the early days. And those thinkers are saying, look, uh, individual liberties are great, but individual liberties, if you take it too far, it acts like a, like a solvent. It basically will destroy, you know, every every traditional institution, like you take the family. Um, if, if the family is not based on uh, a husband and wife um, uh, working towards something that's bigger than themselves and children honoring this bigger thing that's larger than themselves, but instead they learn to think, well, you know, what's best for me at every given moment? Then you you the then the family disintegrates it deteriorates it 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 it, 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 it the parents get divorced and then the ch the 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 children no longer have a family, and the same thing um, is true for a nation, that if 
all you have is freedom and you say, well, our nation is just about freedom and you don't worry about what do we need to do to preserve this. And, and in, the, in the book, I argue that, you know, the, the main kinds of things that you need to preserve it are religion and nationalism in, in the United States, mostly Christianity and, and American patriotism. And if you don't consciously, purposely build these constraints that, that do limit individual liberties, but they limit them in a, in a necessary way, then you'll lose your country. So here, and this all makes perfect sense. I mean, you say it very plainly in the book that libertarianism can't defeat Marxism, only conservatism. I guess as it was originally thought, sort of an English version of conservatism can. It's very interesting to read. Here's my question, and a question that I think a lot of um, your critics might have, not that I'm, I'm lumping myself with that. I'm, I'm just thinking about your political philosophy here. So the argument Thanks. against this English version of conservatism, which is not just libertarianism, it's not just individual rights, make your own choices, even if those choices are bad, because you have a right to do this. The argument um, in favor of the individual liberty train of thought is that if you give a governing authority even a smidgen more power than just the role of defending these, these unalienable rights, then they will abuse it. How do you prevent a government from becoming too authoritarianism if they have moved even an inch away from their role of just protecting individual liberties? Well, well you know, th this exact argument, that the, the question that you asked and the argument between the two sides it is almost exactly the argument between uh, between the, uh, the, 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 the Federalists and the Jeffersonians at the American founding. Because the, the, the Jeffersonians, their position is, it, it's almost exactly what you just said, that, that government is inherently, um, uh, it's just inherently bad. You know, which is like, I mean, the, there, there is an argument there. It's not, it's not like a, a crazy thing to say. But the, uh, the result of this argument is uh, you try to keep all power as much as possible at the local level, and if not, then at the state level, and if not, then, you know, it, you try to keep all power away from any kind of central government. And that, that's basically what, what the Jeffersonians were saying. They, you know, Jefferson himself didn't even want a national constitution. He said, you know, we can meet once every 20 years and, and, and work out what the best arrangements are. And against that argument, there was a, a party that was basically the National Conservative Party. I mean, its name was the Federalist Party. But in this book, I, I argue that the Federalists are the National Conservatives at the American founding. That's, that's George Washington, John Jay, John Adams, uh, uh, Hamilton, and also this, this guy that nobody ever talks about, Governor Morris, who is, is this thinker and political theorist who is actually the guy who, who drafted the American Constitution. So he's a really, he's, he's like the, you know, the, the Jefferson of the, the Constitution. He's like the draftsman of it. And if you take, go back and you look at, you know, who these people are and what they wanted, first of all, they, they, uh, they, they thought that the Constitution of 1777, which we usually call the Articles of Con the Confederation, there, I mean, there was a Constitution before the American, there's a first constitution. And that first constitution was weak. What, what, what I mean by weak, I mean that it, it departed from the English constitution in all these radical ways, um, having uh, a, a plural executive, like all, there, there was no one president or king. There was like, everybody sort of was sort of make, uh, supposed to make decisions together. And as, uh, uh, as a consequence, they couldn't raise armies. They couldn't pay those armies. They, 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 they couldn't even sign a peace treaty and enforce the terms of tr the treaty on the states because they had gone so far in the extreme of worrying, worrying about like, like individual and local liberties that, th that they couldn't even defend themselves. And people don't remember this, that, that when George Washington had to move his army down to Yorktown to try to to try to win the war, like the French are showing up and he needs to move his army. They didn't have any funds. They, they, they collected private donations that, so that they could pay to move the army. I mean, you have to understand how totally crazy this is. And so Washington came out of the American Revolution 
saying this is this is hopeless. Our country, th- I mean, there's, we have no future this way. The only way we have a future is if we have a central government that's powerful enough to do things that are for the common good, that are for the creating a more perfect union, that are for the common defense, that and uh, for the general welfare. I mean, these are these are the expressions that Washington and his party wrote into the American Constitution. And of course, it includes the blessings of liberty. But the blessings of liberty, I argue in this book, the blessings of liberty is, is, is one out of seven principles that Washington and his party wrote into the preamble of the American Constitution. And the, the reality of politics is, and I, I'm, you know, I'm sorry if this is not simple enough for people, but the reality of politics in the real world is if you go too far in the direction of, of just rights, just individual liberties, your country collapses because you because you can't keep it going. And if you go too far in the direction of no, that you know the central government will make decisions about everything, then you you start damaging people's liberties and you start moving towards tyranny. Both of those arguments are true. So unfortunately, I'm asking people to sort of uh, be realistic about this. Since both arguments are true at the extremes, the the actual answer as you know, as the Federalists knew, the actual answer is uh, is in the middle, a strong central government with a distribution of, of powers under federalism. That was their answer. But I think too many conservatives have, have in the last generation have just forgotten that the Federalists were the national conservatives and they're the ones who wrote the Constitution. And, 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 and they think, oh, you know, Jefferson founded our country and we, have, we don't need anything but, but individual liberty. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I could sit here and listen to you talk about this all day because it's really fascinating. We're sort of seeing this crop up in our country too as states and Florida in particular um, and DeSantis, Governor DeSantis is governing in this way where at the local level or the state level, they are, uh, Florida is enacting statutes that are, that do, are inherently moral, right? They, they encompass morality, not just this, not just this idea of individual rights, even if that means you making a bad decision or making a bad decision on behalf of someone else's, else's child. Yoram Hazoni, thank you so much for um, talking to me today. Everyone, I highly recommend that you get his book. It's called Conservatism, A Rediscovery. You can get it, of course, wherever books are sold. Conservatism, A Rediscovery. Yoram, thank you for being here today. It was great to talk to you. already, give this video a thumbs up, hit the subscribe button below, and ring the bell to make sure you never miss a video.